Hi, my name is Alex Casano, and today we'll be having the Clearwater Marine Aquarium here at the Clearwater Historical Society. They will be speaking about their history and mission. I hope you enjoy this presentation. Thank you. All right, well, good morning, everyone. Good Thank morning. you so much for having me here. It's beautiful. Um, now I'm from the Clearwater Marine Aquarium. My name is Chelsea uh, and I work in the education department. So what I focus on on my job is I study the wild dolphins out here in Clearwater Bay. Um, so our study range is actually from around the Johns Pass area all the way up to Citrus County. Um, so we monitor quite a big chunk of the coast here. Uh, we break that into four separate sections, but I'll get into that a little bit later on. I'm just going to talk about a little bit of the history of the aquarium and kind of what we're all about there. So, so these are some photographs of the aquarium in 1978, probably around the same time. Um, so in the early 70s, this building that is now the aquarium was an old water treatment facility. Um, so the city was gracious enough to actually sell us this building for $1. Um, so that's always something that I find really shocking. Um, they wanted to build this aquarium because there was a <clears throat> preserved fish collection called Siorama that had been in storage. Um, so a group of volunteers really wanted to get this going and display this collection of preserved fish and other marine life, as well as start to bring in some animals that were alive as well for people to see. So that is why the aquarium was started. Just a group of volunteers wanting to educate the public about marine life, which I think is really amazing. Um, so around, originally the aquarium was named the Clearwater Marine Science Center. And that 1995, they changed that name to the Clearwater Marine Aquarium to better scope what we do now at the aquarium. So, um, and on the bottom, you can see what our building looks like today. Um, this picture was a rendering, but now it looks almost the exact same as this photo, which is really, really exciting for us. Our expansion is now up and running. Um, the bottom half of the floor is now open to public, but the top half is not quite ready yet. So little by little, we're getting there. Um, so this is my department, the education department. Um, we do uh, many, many different things within that department. We're kind of like um, everything but the kitchen sink in that department. So we have educational programs and community outreach. So kind of like exactly what I'm doing now. Um, we go to when we did have festivals, fairs and things like that, we would go out to those things um, and just educate the public about what we do and how they can help the environment. Um, eco boat and kayak tours. That's what we're doing a lot of at the moment. So we're taking guests out on our boat tours here in Clearwater Bay, telling them what the ecosystem and the environment is like. Hello. Uh, and again, how they can help just by doing little, little things um, in the uh, environment, when they're at the beach, how they can have those small impacts that make a big difference. Um, a little bit what I focus on on my portion of the job is coastal cleanups. So we we're trying to do around four uh, every year so quarterly cleanups and they're super super fun um, people from all over the state will actually come and drive here for a coastal cleanup which I always thought was amazing I always expected it to just be locals but it's people from all over that will drive here to help us clean up the beaches um, I know a lot of focus normally when folks do cleanups is on the beaches um, but Clearwater Beach is very well manicured and kept so I try to focus on the mangrove line um, the mangrove line just collects debris, especially after a windstorm or especially like a hurricane or tropical storm. All that debris just gets trapped in those root systems of the mangrove trees. So we try to focus there. Um, our last cleanup, we got over a thousand pounds of trash. So that's something we we're really proud of. And that was only in about two hours of us being out there and collecting things. So there's still so much left to do. <clears throat> Um, so one of the jobs we have is marine life and environmental specialists. Um, so like I was saying, I focus on a lot of our research that we do here um, within the education department, but the whole aquarium has little research projects going on all the time. Um, resident rehab and animal care, wild animal studies, um, prosthetic technology especially, reef monitoring, 
Um, so if you guys remember, there was a barge that was like our houseboat from the Dolphin Tail movies. Um, so we actually um, kind of took apart that barge and sunk it out, out in the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, have you guys seen any of the videos on that? Okay, it's really cool if you wanna, it's on YouTube. It's on our YouTube channel. They sunk that barge and now it's a flourishing artificial reef. So really cool, that would have just been trash, but now it's under the water um, acting like an artificial reef for tons of different animals. Large grouper, sharks, small fish, all sorts of stuff have been seen around there. Um, so like I was saying, this is the portion of my job that I try to focus on the most. Uh, we study the population of dolphins, um, not only in Clearwater Bay, but along the coast of Florida. Um, so this is one example, his name's Troy. Um, he was rescued uh, about 14 years ago now, so quite a while ago. Um, and he was satellite tagged, you can see here. Um, so a satellite tag actually tells you the location of that animal. Um, any other animal that we rescue and release usually will have like a cattle tag, just like a tag you put on a cow's ear. Um, and those are of course very low cost and they just allow us to visually identify that animal very quickly. Uh, but Troy got a fancy satellite tag and as well as Mandy who was rescued with him. So have you guys by chance seen the Dolphin Tail movies? Yes. You have? Okay, awesome. So if you remember Mandy's story, mm -hmm. that was actually the true story of Mandy and Troy. So after they were released, um, Mandy went off. We have no idea where she went. Her satellite tag pinged a few times in this area, and now we don't know where she went. She could have just picked a new home range. But Troy, we st still see out here very frequently. Um, normally, he's up around the honeymoon area. But usually around springtime when it's mating season, he'll come down here to Clearwater Bay. So depending on the animal, they all have different kind of trends on where they like to visit during certain times of the year. So it's always exciting, especially when we're on our tour boats to see Troy out there in the wild. Um, just kind of like visiting us maybe. He's one of my favorites. Uh, but you can see how distinct he is. So we're able to identify different dolphins by just looking at the dorsal fin. Um, and that's because every single dorsal fin is completely unique. So Troy is a good example of that. He has tons of markings on his fin that you can see from a mile away. He is super distinct. Um, other dolphins in our study just have one teeny tiny little nick on the dorsal fin, and that's how we identify that individual. And um, we also identify on the shape of the fin, um, if it has a curvature, maybe if they have a shark bite elsewhere on their body. So we use anything we can to help identify these animals without having to interact with them. All right, so we merged with Sea to Shore um, with a scientist named Buddy Powell, and he studies right whales, manatees. Um, so we are really excited to partner with him. That kind of broadened our horizons in terms of our re research studies. Um, of course, the aquarium focuses a lot on rescue. So let's see. So this is Lenny here. And what you're looking at is his tail fluke on top of a board. Um, so they're just taking a photograph of what is entangled around his tail. There we go. Um, so that is his tail. So you can see a lot of that tissue has been um, torn and rubbed a lot. And that's because this all around his tail is fishing line or monofilament. And as that monofilament kind of dragged along the bottom, it collected things like this. And this is actually a sea snail egg casing. So that was super heavy, kind of bogged down with water and created a ton of drag on his body. So he, when we found him, was already very lethargic, kind of just like hung out, let us do our thing. And then he was released on his way. Um, so it was actually just a vacationer that called in and had a super good photograph of Lenny, luckily. Um, so when they sent us that photograph, we were able to see his dorsal fin super clear and we knew it was Lenny. <clears throat> um, we have been studying him since 2013. Like I said, dolphins have different trends on where they go during this, this time of the year. Um, so we knew Lenny's favorite places to hang out. So we just sent boats to two or three of those locations and just waited for him. And eventually he just showed up. So that only took a day or so. So super, super quick. And um, if you can imagine trying to find like a needle in a haystack, 
it's kind of the same trying to find one dolphin in all of this water. It can be very difficult. Um, and it usually takes days, months, um, or sometimes we never even find that animal because it can be so difficult. So um, that's kind of how our research contributes to our rescue efforts. Um, so once he was all good to go from that, our vet gave him just a quick physical, made sure he didn't have any infections, and he was on his way. So all of this happened, as you can see, people are in the water with him. So we never had to transport him to a rescue or a rehab facility or anything like that. It was all done in the water with him there. So we try to make it as less stressful for the animal as we possibly can. So usually if you transport them, it causes a bit of stress. So we try not to do that unless we absolutely have to. I'm sure you guys heard on the news in 2019, we had five pilot whales strand up on the shores of Reddington. That was a lot of excitement and commotion for us. So as you can see, this animal is humongous. This is just the dorsal fin and she's holding the tail area here. Um, so five of those guys stranded. We're not really sure why, uh, but this species is very social. So their group is like, if one does something, they're all going to do it. So one of those animals might have just been kind of feeling sick, maybe weak, and stranded up onto the beach. And the rest of them, even though they're totally fine, will just follow suit. Um, so all of these animals were given the clear go-ahead. So three of them were taken offshore on the shelf in the Gulf of Mexico right away. So they put them on a boat and went about 20 miles off the coast to release them in deep water. And these guys were also given satellite tags. Uh, which is really cool but each tag i think is about five thousand dollars so it is a lot of money that's usually why we only give dolphins a cattle tag because we can't five grand every time that is a lot of money so these guys were lucky enough to get satellite tags just because they're a species we don't know very much about so it was a really amazing learning opportunity for us um, two of these animals went to our brand new rehab facility uh, were just held overnight just to make sure that they were clear and were taken to meet them out in the Gulf of Mexico. Um, so these guys were taken around the same general area, and then we saw from their satellite tags that they actually met up again as a group. So that was something that was really, really cool. Um, dolphins are notorious for not wanting to keep their tags, so their tags didn't last very long, but it did give us information that we needed. All right, so rescues in 2019. Uh, uh, 36 sea turtles, five cetaceans, so cetaceans is just a dolphin or a whale, uh, eight manatees, and two river otters. So sea turtles are definitely our number one patient. Um, and just another job description for a rescue biologist. Very, very cool job, but also very demanding. You're on call 24-7. So a lot of our animals were actually rescued on holidays. So Nicholas, one of our resident dolphins, was on Christmas Eve. We had another dolphin named Summer that was rescued on the 4th of July. So they like to strand around holidays, it seems like. Uh, but we do a lot of rehabilitation. Uh, like I said, number one patient is sea turtles. So green sea turtles especially have this sickness that's called fibropapilloma. So it creates tumors that kind of look like cauliflower all over their body. Um, so if those start growing over their eyes or in their mouth, that could cause them to ultimately pass away. Um, and these things also kind of suck the energy out of that animal as well. So if we are lucky enough to have a sea turtle come in with only tumors on the outside, we're able to laser them off. But if they're inside, unfortunately, that is kind of um, lethal for these animals. Um, so we don't know why they only grow on the outside or the inside. Sometimes it's both. Um, there's not a whole lot known about this virus. The only thing that's known is it transfers between sea turtles very quickly. So we are always super careful when we do have a sea turtle come in with this virus. Um, we do put them in quarantine, so we're all very familiar with those things. So that's kind of how those sea turtles are. Uh, we see a lot of entanglement and ingestion of all sorts of things, but I'll show you one. His name's Donkey Kong. There we go.
of human interaction, which means things that are caused by us. So that would be anything like boat strikes or trash ingestion or even fishing lines. <laughs> So one of my favorites, um, Donkey Kong was a really cool turtle. As I said, there are Kemp's Ridley, so the most critically endangered species we have in the world. Um, so thankfully those fishermen saw that thing floating around in the water and brought him in and he was successfully rehabilitated. Uh, well, a ton of our sea turtle patients end up passing balloons. Um, I know a lot of people release balloons in celebrations and things like that. You get about two seconds of joy looking at them and then they all fall down to the ground. So you never really think about where they end up and nine times out of ten it's in the oceans. Um, if not directly, um, put there by streams, rivers, and other things like that. <clears throat> um, so it is super important. Um, maybe just do biodegradable confetti or there's a lot of other different things you can do instead of those big balloon releases. We also rehabilitate seahorses, believe it or not. Um, so this guy's name is Frito. So all of our sea turtles, or sea turtles, seahorses are named after chips. Um, and that's because our very first seahorse was named Cheeto. So Cheeto, the person that was on the beach, thought a seagull had dropped a Cheeto because it was a bright orange thing about this big. So she went to look at what it was and it was actually a seahorse. So we decided to name him Cheeto, and then the tradition just went and went, and now we have Frito, Funyun, all the chips. So he just had a really quick rehabilitation, about four days, and he was entangled in monofilament again. Um, that's usually what we see in a lot of our patients. Um, so he was just untangled from that, made sure he could eat, made, made sure that he could um, float correctly in the water, and he was good to go. Um, Summer, like I was saying, she was stranded on the 4th of July, and she was fully rehabilitated at the Clearwater Marine Aquarium, and now she lives down in the Dolphin Research Center. Um, so if you follow that center on Facebook, they always post pictures of Summer, um, hanging out with her friends down there. She's really, really special. Um, so she is a spotted dolphin, so when they're really small, they look almost exactly like a bottlenose. And as they grow and mature, they get little spots starting on their chin, and then they work their way down to their belly. So now she has tons of cute little spots. So she's a really cool animal. Um, of course, our vet team is so important to us at the aquarium. We only have one veterinarian and one um, vet tech or a vet assistant. So they are constantly so, so busy with all of the animals that we not only have as residents, but all of the intakes that we get every single day. Uh, rehab biologists, these guys and girls are responsible for rehabilitating the sea turtles that come in. It's a very tough job, sometimes can be 24 hours keeping those guys healthy. This is a video of a release. Um, so manatee rescues require 
as many people as physically possible. Those animals are extremely heavy, um, but it's not super uncommon to see a manatee up on dry land. Um, in this case, he was pretty far in um, and it wasn't a mating herd situation, but have you guys ever seen a manatee up on the beach before? You have? So it is not uncommon, especially during the summertime. So right now, we get a lot of calls of female manatees rolling up onto the beach. Um, and they do this because um, they're a part of a mating herd that they, I think, don't want to be a part of. Um, so it'll be a female, and she's actually going to be chased by about 10 to 15 males. Um, so they are moving super quick through the water. The female's just trying to get away from those guys. And eventually, she's going to lose energy from swimming so quickly for such a long period of time. She'll just roll up onto the beach so she can get away from the boys. Um, now, eventually, she will roll back in. Um, so if you do see that, definitely give us a call. We'll send people out to maintain crowd control and just educate people about what's going on. Uh, but eventually, she's going to roll back in, and you definitely don't want to be caught between her and the water. You will be just squished right underneath. So um, kind of interesting. Especially, I don't know why they always choose Clearwater Beach to roll up onto, but they always pick like the busiest beach during the busiest day to roll up onto the beach. Um, so we have a marine animal hospital. Um, our offsite location is brand new. It's at Fred Howard Park, a little ways up north. Um, and that's basically just a big dome with a couple of pools in there for rehabilitating animals. And we also have a trailer there that acts as our kind of like our laboratory, our fish prep kitchen, um, all of that important stuff. So it's really, really exciting. Um, like I said, those pilot whales were the first ones in that facility. So you can see them there rehabilitating in that pool just overnight. They just wanted to make sure they were stabilized and ready to head back out. But you can see how big those pools are given the size of these animals. So they have plenty of space. Um, to be comfortable while they're in there. It's kind of another view of it. Uh, but it's a really beautiful, of course, it's a park, so it's a beautiful location. Um, we just had a rough-toothed dolphin successfully rehabilitate there named Rudy. And I'll tell you a little bit about his story in just a second. There we go. All right, so Rudy, have you guys heard we have two new dolphins at the aquarium? So we have Rex and Rudy, and they're both rough-toothed dolphins. So Rudy was found in Sanibel Island um, around Christmas time, so around December 16th. Um, he was in critical condition. He was very um, skinny, so we weren't really sure why he stranded. We were just immediately going to care for him and try to get him better. Um, for an animal to be released back out into the wild, they have to go through a multitude of tests by the government. Um, so we don't get to decide if they're going to be released, if they're going to stay with us, where they're going to go. That's someone else's decision. So when he was given his hearing test, they found that he was deaf in the area of echolocation. So that is most likely why he was so thin when we rescued him. Couldn't properly echolocate to find his food to survive. So that is why he ultimately stranded up onto the beach. Um, so now, luckily for us, we were deemed the best suited place to be his home. So we were really excited. Um, he just joined us about two weeks, three weeks ago at the aquarium. So he's still brand new. But he also got a friend named Rex. Out in the wild, males will typically be solitary or they'll form a bond with another male. So those males will literally act as wingmen for each other. They'll help each other look for the ladies, watch for predators, look for food, all of that stuff. So. Um, those bonds are really interesting. They last their entire lifetime. Um, so they usually form those bonds around their adolescence and they will travel and hang out together for the rest of their lives. So I think that's pretty interesting, pretty cool. So we're glad that Rudy and Rex are now starting to form that bond. Um, they are really, really enjoying hanging out with each other. You never really know what's gonna happen when you, it's kind of like putting two people in a room together and hoping they get along. Never really know what's going to happen. So luckily, they are getting along super well. Uh, even when they're sleeping, they'll float next to each other in the pool side by side, holding or touching pectoral flippers. So I think that's like them kind of holding hands. It is the cutest thing. Never seen that before. So we were really excited. Um, and Rex was also deaf um, in not only the area of echolocation, but also other frequencies as well. 
Um, so a lot of what we do at the aquarium revolves around our interns and our volunteers. Um, I think about 80% of the people that work at the aquarium are volunteers and interns. So we rely on them very, very heavily. Um, I actually started as an intern in the rescue department and I was just lucky enough to be at the right place at the right time to be hired on when my internship ended. Um, but like I said, we rely on these guys to pretty much run the aquarium day in and day out. They are there taking care of the turtles, helping um, fish prep in the morning every single day about 5 36 a.m. They prep all of the diets. So they are our superstars. Uh, and these are just some of the other departments of the aquarium that I did not have time to mention. But lastly, I did want to talk a little bit about the things I have here. So this, as you can see, is a fishing pole. Um, but this is actually attached to a sea turtle at one point that we found. Um, so his name was Flash, and we call this Flash's fishing pole. Um, and we keep it, it's kind of a junky fishing pole, but we like to keep it because it was so shocking that this um, line was wrapped around his flippers and he was just carrying this fishing pole with him on his way. So luckily someone found him, brought him in so we could detach his lovely fishing pole from him. And of course this is Winter's tail. Um, so Winter has had dozens and dozens of tails over the years. It changes constantly in the design um, and the features of it just to make it more comfortable for her. Um, but this was created for Winter. It's called Winter's Gel. <coughs> so it's a type of polymer. It's basically like a sticky sock um, because if you think of a dolphin, they're super slippery. Their skin is slick. So if you just put this on Winter, it would just slip right off. So they had to come up with something to help make it more comfortable and also stick to her body. So this is like super stretchy, very sticky. Um, so they put this on first and then they um, attach the tail after that. Um, but this, like I said, was created specially for winter, but now humans actually use it to make their prosthetics more comfortable for them. Um, so a lot of people will actually come into the aquarium wearing winter's gel, saying that they actually didn't wear their prosthetic previously because it was so uncomfortable. Um, those things can sometimes cause abrasions, and just uncomfortable rubbing against the skin. And this um, took that away from them. So that was really, really special to see all these people coming in wearing a gel that was made for a dolphin, but now really, really helps humans as well. These are just a couple pieces of sea turtle artifacts. Um, this is the skull of a loggerhead sea turtle. They are one of the largest species of sea turtles, uh, but their heads are definitely the biggest. This is only about maybe a young adolescent sea turtle. Their heads can be about the size of a basketball or even bigger when they're full size. Um, so the area back here houses um, a lot of muscle and that helps them crunch down on clams and sea snails and all sorts of things. Uh, but we have quite a few sea turtle skulls of all different species um, just to educate the public about the differences between these guys. Uh, but it is illegal to have these things as personal items. Um, we have a special permit for each and every one, um, and most of them are um, taken from people that have them illegally. So this is the carapace of a loggerhead sea turtle. So the same species, but just a little, little baby one, just pretty cute. And as you can see, their spine is actually fused and attached to the top of their shell. Um, so many people think, as I did, that sea turtles or any type of turtle can crawl out of their shell, but they cannot because they are literally attached to it. Um, and that's why boat strikes can be so harmful for these guys because their spine is so close to the area where we normally see boat strikes happening. Um, and that can cause paralysis, which is why we have quite a few of our sea turtles as residents at the aquarium. And then my last little thing here, this is the plastron. So kind of like the belly plate of the sea turtle. That just helps protect their bottom side. So if you hold it up to the light, you can kind of see through it. You can see those bones. Um, but it is a much, much thinner than the top shell. But it still provides some protection. Um, sea turtles' natural predators are just going to be um, bull sharks and tiger sharks. Really anything that can crush through this really tough shell. Uh, but that does it for my presentation. Does anybody have any questions? You did a great job. 
Thank you. <laughs> when you do the, 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 the beach cleanup, mm -hmm. do y'all announce that? Or like, yeah. it, like on your calendar? Um, so we will make an announcement. Um, I have like a mailing list mm -hmm. of people that I'll send like a direct email to. Uh, but we'll post it like on our website and our Facebook and sometimes our Instagram account as well. So we try to kind of get it out as far as we can. Um, but if you want me to add you to our mailing list, I would be happy to. All right. Yeah. Oh, that's a good question. Um, I think we're going to be able to help so many more animals. Um, just seeing the scope of the new building. Uh, I saw it for the first time about a couple weeks ago, and I was just blown away. Um, so we're going to be able to house many more dolphins that can't survive out into the, in the wild, which is really exciting. Um, the area that's you that was used to house the dolphins previously, we're going to maybe have manatee rehabilitation at some point, fingers crossed, not really sure on that yet, but um, potentially use that space for a different uh, species of animal or just more space for sea turtle rehabilitation. So we're really, really excited for that. Is that polymer used, uh, you know, in normal, you know, medicine for humans? Yep. Okay. Yeah, it's really cool. Um, so like I said, tons of people will come in wearing their prosthetics that they had never worn before because they now have winter's gel. All right. Absolutely. Thank you guys so much for having me. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you.